a couple of things that have just occurred to me uh, in line with what's just been said. I, one of the legs of legacy has been an attempt to organize uh, um, scholars in such a way that there would be continuity in Book of Mormon studies. It's been a futile activity. I was very active in the original University Archaeological Society of Wells Jakeman, which was all the farms there was at the time. And, uh, but it came a cropper. It just wasn't, didn't work very much. I backed off on that. Several different things I tried to get people together. One of the troubles was the people there were to get together wanted to push their own points. They didn't want progress. They wanted that their point of view was presented and dominate. Uh, yeah. So I backed off. And when Jack Welch came in 1980, assessing whether he wanted to come to BYU as a, to join the law faculty, he had the initial farms organized in California. I immediately jumped on it and said, you have my full support. As a matter of fact, I think I was the only BYU professor at first that fully supported him because I could see from my past experience that he knew how to manage such things. And that from his legal point of view, he could see that it would work. And it did. So uh, my <coughs> five years from 1980 to the time of my retirement in 86 was uh, strongly supportive of the early the early uh, farms. I've been associated with it since in its various fulminations. Uh, I'm progressively more disappointed with what has happened to it. Once it got inside BYU, that was kind of a, an ultimate death knell uh, because then you had to satisfy administrators. And the farms did, did not need administration. So when uh, I backed off, well, I, I fully supported Farms Maxwell Institute as far as that went until they moved the offices and didn't offer me another office and uh, made me go home. I said, no, yeah, well, so it's probably time anyway. But uh, I've been disappointed with the way Maxwell, Maxwell Institute has moved or not moved in regard to the Book of Mormon. And um, so when Book of Mormon con Connect and uh, Kirk and Kirk and Book of Mormon Central. Central, sorry. Uh, when Book of Mormon Central came along and Jack and, and Kirk had this notion, uh, I fully supported it. And if I had the strength, I would participate more fully. But this is the limit of my strength. So, What do you see as the vision of Book of Mormon Central moving forward? What would you like to see have happen? 
to make the connections, to make the connections with active researchers, and to cultivate a sense of community among researchers. We were just talking just before we uh, re restarted about Brian Stubbs and uh, I've encouraged Brian for 25 years in his work on uh, languages because he was the only one who was willing to invest in it. Maybe that's because he didn't have a PhD. Uh, in, in other words, he didn't have to defend himself. He just worked and uh, his work shows what he can do and shows the truth. Uh, uh, if uh, if uh, this organization can build a community of such people, such people who are devoted to the cause and not to their personal publicity gain, then it will please me. And I think it's possible. It's possible. But I will venture that in 25 years, this will fall apart too. It's in the nature of organizations that they tend to do that. Like the Retrenchment Society of Brigham Young. <laughs> well, okay. Well, Book of Mormon geography has become very fragmented and lots of different theories have come up. What, why do you suppose so many different theories out there? Well, the main, main reason there are so many theories is because people are lazy. They pick and choose uh, passages in the Book of Mormon that refer to geography, but they don't do all of it. They don't do all of it, and you must do all of it, and you must satisfy every aspect of it in order to arrive at the truth. Um, uh, people that pick up on, well, there's some of the people in uh, Peru, you know, so and so. There's a, this, there's this hill, or the, there's this wall, or there's a, there's this area, this site, or there's, there's this lake, Titicaca, or whatever, and they get fascinated by that thing itself, rather than the question of what does it all mean, what do, how does it all fit together, and uh, I. I've tried. I've tried to. Uh, uh, I've tried to maintain a comprehensive view at all times, and I can't help what anyone else does. What role do you see technology playing in Book of Mormon research? Well, I, my view of uh, the history of technological development of the last <coughs> 25 years is that it's unpredictable. So I'd say, so I would say, it'll be what it'll be. What it'll be what someone makes of it. I think the prospects are interesting. I should say just a word about filming. I've participated in, uh, as a quote, expert, unquote, on the preparations for a number of Book of Mormon films. Very hard work because the people from an aesthetic point of view have their aims. They want to tell a story. They want some romance in there. Whether there's any or not, they're going to have it. And uh, they've listened to me sometimes 
for some things and they've ignored me for some others. I have a, a, a number of things written on, on my computer that no, nobody would ever want to see again, but uh, cautions about you got to look at this, you can't ignore this, that kind of thing. And I think the same would be true with all technology. There'd be attempts at where the technology, technology takes the lead, and that's not the way it's going to work. It, it, it has to be a, a follower and a supplement if it's going to be useful. That's all I can say. That's more than I can say. So what, what are some areas of Book of Mormon research you consider promising? I, or I would like to consider promising, uh, if they ever get done. If, if efforts ever move in that direction. Uh, one uh, certainly is the langu uh, language connections. Uh, uh, I find it interesting that uh, the one re review of my Mormon's Codex was by uh, Mark Wright and uh, Brent Gardner on inter Interpreter. <laughs> and they actually said, unbelievably to me, oh, you can just skip to language and biology. They, they don't mean anything. Holy cow. <laughs> they mean all kinds of things. Get at it. Do it. Uh, you, you can't dismiss possibilities. Uh, lang language has great possibilities, and Brian, uh, Brian is leading the way, and I say, hey, good, go. Well, what advice would you give young scholars to getting engaged? Well, I, I would program? say also... Uh, uh, archaeology needs to be pursued, but it's a very difficult thing to pursue because it's very costly. And there are so many ways to go wrong. Uh, interpretive ways to go wrong. And so you may think you haven't got anything, and maybe you don't, but maybe you do. And uh, I, I think what I've done in Mormon's Codex in the last few chapters uh, on the archaeology is to point out things that have been significant, even though they may not have looked to others as significant. So keep your eyes open. Keep, uh, don't shut off any possibilities. Okay. And uh, so what What was your question? Well, just any other advice that you would give scholars, oh. young scholars starting out? Don't give up. I think I've exemplified that 65 years. Uh, especially when there were times when it was not at all clear what was going to result. And the results have been superior to what I could have anticipated 30 years ago, say. Uh, so that's, that's one bit of advice. Um, don't, don't give up on the Book of Mormon. It says some things that we haven't plumbed yet um, because we haven't asked the right questions. You have to ask the right questions. And uh, the church membership in general is not asking any questions about it at all. Uh, uh, it can answer some questions if it is examined carefully, but not if just casually. Okay, that's all the advice I have. <laughs> that's Except keep, keep digging. That's good. <laughs> yeah, we absolutely want to get his testimony. Don't forget. Yeah, that's that's kind of where I was actually heading. In the next, I've got pretty much two more questions left. Okay. Um, what would, what do you, 
know spiritually that you wouldn't have known without doing your research? I'm not sure that there's anything. I've never had any question that the uh, Book of Mormon was what it represents itself to be. When I was a child, it just seemed so obvious to me. It's obvious that uh, although I was not a, a reader of the Book of Mormon uh, very much, it was obvious to me that it was just what it said it was. And uh, it continues to be obvious to me. Uh, so, spiritually, that's another matter. That's, it's a, it's a, what I've been thinking about lately is what it means, what it has meant for the church. The church could have been uh, originated, organized after Joseph Smith's first vision, but it wasn't. It couldn't be. It couldn't be because that was a matter of opinion. To, for Joseph simply to say, oh, I had the vision of these two figures and so on and so on. And so on. And the answer is, oh yeah, well, you just thought that up. But with the Book of Mormon, there is a thing, a thing, and it must be explained. It cannot not be explained. And uh, the explanations that have been offered that are other than the book's own just don't fly. They're, they're really absurd. Uh, Joseph Smith made it up. Uh, Joseph Smith didn't make anything up. He couldn't have made it up. Uh, so, the Book of Mormon is not only the keystone of our religion, it is also the cornerstone. And Joseph said that. Also the cornerstone of our religion. It's the cornerstone in the sense that it is firmly in place, it is not going to shift. It is, everything is built on or around it. And the keystone has another significance, of course, but uh, the spiritual significance of the Book of Mormon is that it exists. It must be accounted for. And anyone who attempts to account for it other than the way Joseph accounted for it is unfortunately limited in their perspective and view. Won't do. Is that your testimony? Oh, I, I'm, I, my testimony every time I give it my ward is the Book of Mormon is exactly what it says it is. Nothing more, nothing less. Exactly what it says it is. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I have a new, you may not have seen it yet, but the new ensign has an article, and I'm very grateful to Mormon, as I say at the end of that. Very grateful for his producing that that book because everything else depend <clears throat> depended upon it. We would not be in the same church situation at all if it were not for the Book of, book of Mormon. The kingdom of God could not advance as it will. Um, it's a great confirmation Uh, that's all. Okay. Um, you still want the coat? No. No question? Uh. Would you tell us a little about your relationship with Michael Coe? About what? About your relationship with Michael Coe. <laughs> He's been one of your strong supporters of your diffusionist notions. Well, I sent him a copy of uh, 
my, my book with uh, Johannesson. I haven't sent him the Mormon's Codex, but no, let's see, it was Mormon's Codex I sent him, I, and the other book as well. And he responded, well, uh, you seem to want to bring contacts across the Atlantic. Uh, I tend to bring them across the Pacific, which it means he simply doesn't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, because Murek came across the Atlantic, I, I believe, and, and Lehigh across the Pacific. Uh, he just has a limited view, but he did tell me in a letter when a year and a half ago, I guess, he said, if I had, if I had my life to live over again, I would spend at least half of it demonstrating a connection between Southeast Asia and Mesoamerica. He says, that's very plain to me. But he doesn't talk a lot about that to his colleagues because they don't want to hear it, I think. Yeah. Uh, I probably said somewhere, and I can't remember where, what he said once that he was talking at BYU uh, under the anthropology department and about his current work. This is 25 years ago, probably, when he was still doing active work. And I went up to him afterward and, and greeted him. We've been old friends for a long time. He said, John, I don't want to talk to you. He said, you're, you're too intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I didn't. <laughs> uh, what he meant was, I might raise questions that he knew would be well informed, but probably uh, raise questions that he didn't want to deal with. Uh, that's pretty much our relationship. Mutual respect, I think. Could you give us a little insight into your relationship with Dave Kelly? Yeah. Good old Dave. Uh, I can't even remember how I began. He was a graduate student at Harvard and uh, an independent thinker then, as he always was, uh, and a mature thinker. However it came about, it may have been about my uh, um, Master's thesis, the Polynesian American collection. That probably was it, because it was in 50, yeah, it would have been about 1951 when I first knew him. I was a student, he was a student. But we began to write to each other, and he would send me long screeds, five, six single space pages of what he was thinking and uh, speculations and so on. It's all very well informed, or it looked like to me. And uh, he welcomed what I shared with him. So we continued writing for years. He got his PhD, he went to teach it, I think at Texas Tech. Uh, and continue to work, some in Peru. 
he, he did some archaeology in Peru, but mostly in Mesoamerica. And he uh, kept expanding his diffusionist views. Uh, and that's, that was our common ground. I don't remember a time when we didn't communicate, except it might be a couple of years when we didn't. But it was just like uh, you interrupt the con conversation for a little while. And uh, he visited me a couple of times here. And he was a great friend. His wife is an archaeologist also, but uh, her concern has been really the Toltec era in Mesoamerica. Anyway, he ended up at Calgary. Isn't that, is, is it the University of Calgary? Yes. I was trying to think if there was a University of Alberta or something like that. Yeah, Calgary. I visited him once up there. Uh, forgotten what the occasion was. But we were good friends and good mutual informants. Uh, I offered to compile his Mutifusion's writings in a book once. And uh, he sent me a, a few things that I otherwise wouldn't have. But I never got around to it, I'm sorry to say. But uh, partly uh, his interest and mine were shared in the connection with Oceania. He, he found uh, language relationships in, uh, I guess, a Fijian language or, or a Polynesian language from the Fiji area that I found very interesting and confirmatory to what I was doing. Anyway, he was a, a, as we met as diffusionists, he was one of the uh, four or five key figures always. Uh, and I, I, I miss him. I was hoping to share a copy of Mormon's Codex with him. But he passed away. Uh, uh, that's all I can say about him. He's a very good friend. He has uh, incredible respect among Linda Sheely, her colleagues, and uh, uh, basically David Stewart, Peter Matthews, all those people that were so influential in the decipherment of yeah. Maya, they have uh, high respect for Dick Kelly. Oh, they should, yeah. Yeah. He is cited as still one of the basic, uh, the basic uh, workers in the field of decipherment. Yeah. John, we would like to hear a little bit more about those 10 days in the Jeep in the Central Depression. Well, fortunately, I can't remember very much. That must have been an exciting time for you. <laughs> well, I guess it was. The excitement has tended to grow, uh, to uh, dissipate. But uh, it was both exciting and frustrating because uh, Tom Ferguson, Tom Ferguson's real interest everywhere we went was to ask whether anyone had found figurines of horses. <laughs> no, 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 Tom. <laughs> if we had found, found them, what would we know? They found a figurine of a horse. <laughs> uh, but, you know, he was looking for iron ore or to explain the iron or so on. He had a limited view of archaeology and what it could do. Uh, I had enough knowledge of um, pre-classic Mesoamerican archaeology that 
I could place the sights pretty much in perspective that we were encountering and they knew enough about the pottery. But uh, Tom really wanted to get on to the next place, get on to the next place, more. Uh, we were so busy with taking notes and recording observations of so and so and so and so and so and so. Well, there's a site over, I, I've heard there's a site over here. You know, that's the kind of concern, concern we had. Uh, not a synthesis of any kind. Uh, and then after it was over, he flew back home and I was left in a hotel room with a collection of shirts and figurine heads and trying to figure out how to get them home, uh, which I did, but it was not pleasant. And I, so it was kind of indeterminate what to make of all that we had said, uh, found. We had found a lot that must be significant, but in uh, geographical interpretations couldn't, uh, were not obvious immediately. One of the things, he, he still had odd ideas and he was the boss of the place. He was funding it. He was calling the shots in a sense. I was uh, trying to put a few limits on him, what he was doing, and my concern was to keep him quiet <laughs> as much as possible. Uh, so we didn't find Zarahemla. Uh, the nearest I came to it was we could have gone across lots in the jeep, across grassland, uh, short grassland for Savannah for um, 20 miles and got to Santa Rosa, which turned out, to, in my view, to be Zerahama, but I didn't quite make it. But I was in the land, nevertheless, and uh, along the river, and that was kind of enough. Uh, yeah, we, we were being guided by a, a young man who, who didn't know a lot. He was uh, an employee of the State Museum. And he was just, just a young guy. He knew how to drive the Jeep and could find us a place to sleep and so on. But uh, he didn't have any knowledge of any kind, but he was, he was a nice fellow, kind companion. So uh, there was, an, I was pretty much isolated intellectually. And uh, that was not a time to be thinking. Uh, there was so much to do. Okay. That, that's all I can say about it. Anything else? Any any remnant questions that you had on? I, I think for the most part you said it. You covered it in some form or another. Well, uh, I'm grateful for the privilege Thank you. you've given me of talking this way. <laughs> well, maybe maybe one last question. Why, why does Book of Mormon archaeology and anthropology matter? It matters in, in, the, in the way that uh, Jack Welch phrased the early forms objective. I've forgotten who he quoted, but the point was 
there are legitimate concerns about the Book of Mormon. We need to deal with them, not ignore them. So this is a matter of disposing of interesting or potentially significant questions and to place them in their correct context. It, to really to shape the questions better uh, rather than the, the, to so suppose that we've already shaped them and found the answers that are not correct. Uh, I mean, think of Jack with chiasmus. You know, who had thought of the question? No one had thought of the question of what it might mean, because they didn't even know what it was. And when he discovered it, then he asked the question, well, what significance does this have for the Book of Mormon? And it has some. It's not vital, but it has some significance as evidence for it and as a means of literary analysis. But uh, it's dealing with the real questions of the Book of Mormon, and that's how I've seen all that I've done is not about the book itself, but to sweep away any questions that somebody might think were significant barriers to acceptance of it. There are no barriers. It's all just the way it says. Well, thank you very much for thank you. the privilege. Thank you. Well, that's <laughs> excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, I don't do anything for claps. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's never been your motivation. <laughs> yeah.